Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to speak with you about uh, metal ions interactions with biomolecules. As you can see, I know many of you probably thought that in Sweden everything is frozen. No, we have actually sea. And in the sea, we have metal ions and fish and many things that can interact with them. And it's not all the time frozen. Perhaps if you come in uh, February, if it's uh, too sunny and too nice in uh, Sao Carlos, you can see this uh, part of the sea frozen. But right now, you can actually go down to the sea and bait, bait in it if you like water at the temperature of about 10 degrees centigrade. So, I'm not here to speak about the sea. I'm here to speak about protein ion interactions and protein salt interactions. And I will present you our uh, PET protein, our model that's, oh, sorry, the S6 ribosomal protein. I will then describe simulations that I carried out and their results and some things that we found out from the PDB and we'll get to the conclusions. What we have here is a laser. I used to work in a laboratory that uh, was called the Laser Laboratory for Fast Reactions in Biology. And what we actually did, we attached dyes to proteins and these dyes were actually photoacids. You could excite them and then they emit protons and you have indicators that would change their colors when they bind to these protons and then you could follow proton transfer on the molecular surface. This is my supervisor here when he was much younger than today and that's our research assistant, Dr. Nachliel when she was not in the lab. Mind you, she was not working in the lab to, with microphones, no. What she did in the lab was working with me on this laser thing because we worked in small cuvettes in solutions and then in the small cuvette there was a little bit of protein, not too much. We didn't need huge amounts of proteins like you would need, for example, for NMR or X-ray crystallography, just a little bit. And because we were working with these things that could bind to protons, it was necessary that we will not use buffers. So it was very, very difficult to control the pH of the solution without buffer, as you chemists can imagine. And then one gentleman or lady should be at the other side of this laser and tuning it. And then the other one should work and put just tiny amounts of acid or base on this cuvette. And I'm afraid that my hands are too human for this task. So if I would try to interfere with the pH in this cuvette, I put just a tiny bit of KOH or something like this and the pH would go skyrocketing. If I put just a little bit of acid, it would be too acidic. So you need somebody that was really excellent in this trained to do this, and this was this lady. What I did was tuning the lasers, and then we can follow these wonderful reactions on the protein surface. But I'm not going to t speak about those, but just mention one thing. When we started to work with this uh, protein, we worked with a protein called the S6 ribosomal protein, and you're going to meet, him to meet the protein today. We found out that if we worked without any salt in the solution, then it was quite fast that we could not work with the protein. It started aggregating. But a tiny amount of salt, as little as 30 millimolars, that was enough to have the protein stable. And it was indeed stable. You could transfer it from Europe to Israel without a problem. You didn't need to refrigerate it and you could always use it again. It's remarkably stable as long as you have a little bit of salt. And salt interacts with the protein surface. That was something that was found already at the end of the 19th century by Hofmeister, who studied the effects of salt on precipitation of protein. And what he found out is that there are some salts that lead to 
protein denaturation or salting out. So if you add amount, increasing amounts of these salts to solution, you see that the proteins st start to aggregate. So you see that the solution becomes cloudy. There are other salts that do the other thing. They are solubilizing protein. They are salting them in. And that means that if you have more and more salt in the solution, it's easier to solubilize protein. You can add more proteins and it will solubilize. You will not see aggregates. The solution will stay clear. Now, Hofmeister worked with salts. He didn't know anything about ions because he was working at the end of the 19th century in Prague, although he was German. And at the same time, in Sweden, Arrhenius discovered the ions, but uh, there was no internet, not even a telephone. So until the news traveled to the whole world, Hofmeister moved on, and he didn't work with this anymore. So he didn't know that these salts, they are actually combinations of ions. But today we know this, and we know that there are different cations and ions with different properties with respect to this solubility of proteins, and that it's not only solubility of proteins. So ions like SO4 or HP42- that lead to protein denaturation and aggregation, they also increase the stability of proteins, and they have certain characteristics. When these are anions, they are strongly hydrated and hard, and they are of high charge density. Minus 2 here, or OH minus is a little bit better than something like iodine, which is soft and the charge density is lower in this respect. Or this could be also weakly hydrated soft cations with low charge density, such as this one, uh, ammonium or quaternary amines. So we have this, and we know that there are a lot of chemical properties that are influenced by this Hofmeister series. But the origin of the Hofmeister series remains a mystery. And for many years, the explanation was that there are interactions with ions and solvents. So these um, proteins that lead to aggregation, they are cosmotropic. They lead to ordering of the water molecules nearby, whereas those that uh, increase the solubility, they are chaotropic. So they decrease the order of water nearby. But today we know that this cannot provide an explanation for the Hofmeister series. What is the explanation? That's, as I said, still a mystery. All of these Hofmeister effects, they occur when you have a solution which is really concentrated, or that's what we thought. Working with ions in several molars, maybe in solution. But that's not always the case. Already in the 1920s, Lev <laughs> at the United States studied the effect of cations on the rate of water diffusion through membranes with gelatin absorbed to these membranes. And he found out that the effect is greater for trivalent cations than divalent. And then comes lithium, which is with the highest density of charge, sodium, potassium, and rubidium. For anions, it was the same. You start with trivalent ions, then divalent, but then comes sodium, which is the largest and the least dense of these cations. So the order of anions is not the same as the Hofmeister series. There you have divalent ions and then chlorine, not iodine as here. So if you say that interactions with a solvent play a significant effect, we wouldn't have such effects as Lev found out. So how can this be explained? Lev concluded that there are some specific interactions between proteins and ions. And that's remarkable that he already noticed this in the 1920s. So there are some interactions between proteins and ions that are specific. It depends on the protein, maybe. It depends on the type and the nature of the salt that we have in solutions. Today, we know that there is a wide range 
of specific interactions. Ninham and co-workers, for example, in Australia, they studied dependence of enzyme activity, DNA nuclease, on salt. So you have different salts with different concentration, and they found out that nucleose activity is affected not only by the concentration of the salt, but actually by the combination of ions in this salt. So the effect is highly ion per specific. It's not just, say, lithium and chloride together. The effect of lithium will be different when it's in solution with other anions. So it's highly ion per specific. And today we know that salt interferes with many biochemical reactions. A few examples. Peptide folding. Fibrillation of proteins, of human serum albumins. And thermal stability of collagen, which can be important for working with skins. All of these are affected by the nature of the very specific salts that we are using. To study these salts, I use the model protein, and that's the S6 ribosomal protein. It's part of the 30S ribosomal unit of bacteria, and it has no physiological function associated with ion transport. And that's important, because if I want to study about the interactions between ions and proteins, I don't want to have a protein that already interacts with specific ions. I want something that does not have any role in ion transport. And that's one example, and it's very nice because it's small, it's globular, it's thermostable, so it's ideal both for measurements and for simulations. And one other plus is that it has 16 positive and 16 negative residues on its surface. You see them here in red are the negative, in blue are the positive. So there are a lot of interaction sites. There are a lot of sites that can bind these salt ions. What did I do to study this protein? I used molecular dynamic simulations. That's, uh, these are simulations where we solve neutron equations of motion based on a given potential. And I use classical simulations. And when I say classical, I means that I didn't, it means that I didn't have any quantum mechanical potentials there. I assume that there are no breaking and formation of bones I cannot follow, for example, on proton transfer. And I neglect any polarization. So I assume that the ions are always charged, always spherical, for example. And protein residues, they do not exchange electrons between them. But that's the standard thing to do when you simulate biomolecules, because they are so huge. If you start to consider the electrons, that takes a lot of computation time. I simulated everything with a program called Gromax. I don't get, won't get into all of these details, but I can start speaking about what we found. There is a problem when working with ions together with proteins. You have to choose the right parameters. Why? Because we have parameterization, we have parameters for these ions, but they do not always reproduce the physics. We have potassium chloride solution. They start to precipitate at very high ionic concentrations. But in the simulation, you start to see clusters or crystals sometimes already at one molar concentration. So it's very important that we work with the right parameters. That's if we use native parameters in amber, for example. Then we have a problem with hydration. The ions are hydrated in reality. But if the potential is so that they, are, they like the water too much, then it's not good, because then they don't interact with the proteins. And what we find found out, to make a long story short, is that we use ion parameters that are quite reasonable for sodium, potassium, and chloride. There are some deviations from the experiments. For example, 